Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob here, Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Today is August 2nd, 2020. Ooh, do me a favor, pray for me. I got a uh, hurricane well, tropical storm, hurricane off the coast. It's supposed to come right by where I live. So, but, hey, the Lord's will be done. Okay, so, somebody sent me a thing, it was interesting, on water as reference to the Spirit, or Holy Spirit, I thought, hmm, I can see it, but I don't know that much about it. I mean, it, you know, the water is, water is mentioned a lot in the Bible. Um, you had uh, baptisms was in water, and uh, sometimes water was indicative of people. And, uh, you know, so you had a lot of different things. Now, one thing about the King James Bible is if you are looking at a word and you're not sure what exactly it means or the usage, uh, you can go to a site and uh, like the Blue Letter Bible or the King James Bible online, which I prefer over the Blue Letter Bible because that was uh, Chuck Messler and uh, Calvary Chapel, but uh, you could look up the first usage, and usually reading in the context, it'll give you an idea of the theme for the word for the rest of the Bible. But uh, what can I tell you? So with that in mind, let's read Genesis 1. In the beginning, right? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, Spirit of God, moved upon the face of the waters. Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So, spirit moved waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. You didn't know it, but a day starts at the evening. Uh, you know, man makes it, oh, day starts at midnight. No. When the sun goes down, evening, boom. That's, that's a, a day, a new day with the Lord. Darkness to light. From the kingdom of the devil to the kingdom of the Lord. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. There is a verse in, I think it's in Job, which is some Bible scholars say are the oldest book in the Bible, and I tend to agree with them. I didn't used to, but I, I looked at the evidence, and I tend to agree with them. But um, it used to be, some Bible scholars say that there used to be a canopy of water in the air. 
Excuse me. I tried to stop that, but I couldn't. So there was a canopy of water in the air. And um, the thing is, if there was a thick canopy of water, you'd have visible light, but it would uh, filter out much of the ultraviolet rays that cause, you know, like skin cancer and sunburns. But not only that, it would uh, increase the pressure of the air uh, because you have extra weight in the uh, atmosphere. And they theorize that was why people lived so long prior to the flood of Noah because it was filtering out all the uh, dangerous radiation that's no longer well, some of it's being filtered out, but a great deal more was filtered out uh, when you had this canopy of water above the sky. And uh, you couldn't really see the stars like you see them now. Of course, you could see the sun and the moon, but it was, you know, different. And if you want to investigate this theory more, uh, you could type in Kent Hovind, H-O-V-I-N-D, uh, water canopy prior to the flood or, you know, something like that. And uh, he had a very interesting study on it. I haven't looked at it in over 20-something years, so a lot of this is just from memory. But uh, he, boy, he suffered greatly for his ministry. I mean, they wanted him, when he started talking about the uh, Babylonian system, um, they said, oh, well, we're going to have to s smack him down. Um, he spent nine and a half years in prison for spending his own money. Yeah, they lied and said he was a tax evader, but that wasn't, that wasn't what they charged him with. They charged him with a thing called structuring which is basically if you deposit or withdraw more than $10,000 cash, the bank has to report it to the government. I don't know, the Treasury, the IRS, whatever. And uh, he was making like, you know, five, six, seven thousand uh, dollars deposits and withdrawals. And then the government said, oh, well, you're doing this so that you don't have to put in 10000 so it doesn't get reported. So basically, cash is basically illegal. But he spent nine, nine and a half or so years in prison for basically spending his own money. And then, of course, the lying Antichrist media called him a tax evader, but, you know, uh, yeah, but Kent did a, some really good stuff. Uh, he's not the same since he got out of prison. His old stuff is excellent. There's a few things I disagree with him on. Um, but, uh, you know, does any of us have it all figured out? I, I mean, I don't have it all figured out. This study here, I'm not even sure where it's going to end up going. Um, because I'm kind of flying blind here. I've got an idea. But uh, but there was a uh, canopy of water. And it, uh, you know, filtered out the bad radiation. That's why people like Methuselah lived, you know, over 900 and something years. And then after the flood, the Lord said uh, 120 years was going to be basically the lifespan of a human. And... Um, you know, that was it. So, some interesting facts about water. Your body, from what I've read, is like 93% water. Without water, uh, plants use water to have the nutrients. It's the transport uh, to transport the minerals from the soil 
through the roots to the plant. And, of course, our body does the same thing. Uh, you can go 40 days without food, approximately, um, depending upon how fat you are. Some of us are fatter than others. I was 118 pounds when I went into high school. I wore a 29 waist. Uh, couldn't hardly get a date in high school. All the girls looked at me and said, Oh, you're so skinny. Why, why don't you eat? I used to eat five, five meals a day. I was always hungry. And I couldn't gain any weight. You know, and then I think when I left high school, I was like 135. And then uh, when I got out of the army, boy, I was fit. I was, I was really fit. Um, I think I weighed about 165. Now I weigh more, a little bit, a little bit more than that. But it's, but uh, when I got out of the army, I had almost zero body fat. Well, I don't have that problem anymore. Um, but uh, yeah, but you can only, but enough about me. But you can only live about three days without water. And if you're in the desert, where you know you got temperatures of 120, 100 something, you know degrees. Um, you won't make it even three days, I don't think. I haven't tried it, don't know for sure, don't have any experience, just telling you what I know. So, uh, all right, so let's see, we read, all right, we read verse 8, let's read verse 9. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear and it was so and god called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called he seas and god saw that it was good now there is a thing about um they, they theorized that uh, there was one huge land mass back when this was happened. And then there was water on the ground and there was water in the air. And that was, and in the flood, you had uh, the fountains of the deep were opened. There's under, you know, there's underground water, uh, rivers all over the place. Matter of fact, they find them in the desert even. Of course, they're really deep. Um, but let's take a look at something. In Genesis 10.25, And unto Eber were born two sons. Now, Eber was, most Bible scholars will say, he was the progenitor of the Hebrews. So, Two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. So there was like a super continent back in the day. And then I guess in his day, the earth was divided. And this was after the flood. So evidently, you know, they've even, you know, they believe that there's a thing called continental drift. Continents are slowly moving. And that's probably why you get earthquakes, right? And his brother's name was Joktan. All right, let's take a look at uh, Genesis 6. Now, the thing is, if you don't know why God destroyed the earth in the flood of Noah, Noah's day, People will say, ah, well, that's because they were evil. Uh, yeah, they were indeed evil. I'm not denying that. But the real reason was is because the sons of God marrying the daughters of men were the fallen angels. They were, you know, look, look, people, I got an entire playlist on this subject that proves it beyond a doubt. Job 38, uh, you know, believers and unbelievers do not get married and have giants for children, okay? 
if that was true, there'd be all kinds of giants running around. Well, maybe they are, are, and they're playing for the NBA. I don't know. Oh, wait, they're not playing for the NBA because we got social distancing because of the COVID whatever. So, yeah. But, um, you know, that's the kind of nonsense that you learn in churches today. And let me tell you something. This is not a controversial thing. The fallen angels intermarrying with the women. Or interbreeding, I should say. Because that wasn't a marriage. Uh, it, you know, it was common knowledge back before the modern church world uh, went into apostasy. It's horrible. Absolutely horrible. And Satan's minions do not want us to know that this happened. And that's why they push this. Well, everybody can be saved. Uh, no, they can't. I'm sorry. If you think everybody can be saved, I suggest you read Malachi 1, where God said he hated Esau, and he would lay his heritage waste for the dragon of the wilderness. And the Bible clearly tells you a man's heritage is his children. You know, Esau married into the Canaanites, the Hittites. And the Bible clearly declares in Obadiah that there's not going to be any remaining of Esau. Zero. Uh, what's his name? Josephus, Jewish historian in the days of the Romans. He said that Herod, King Herod, that evil bastard, which is a Bible word, uh, they said he was a descendant of Esau Edom. You think, you know, when Christ was taken to Herod, uh, you know, Pilate, Pilate, when he heard that uh, Jesus was of Galilee, he sent him to Herod. And Herod wanted to see a magic show. And what did Jesus say to him? Nothing. Jesus didn't say not one word to Herod. Casting pearls before swine. And people think, oh, well, you know, all, all Herod's got to do is believe in Jesus. Well, Satan believes in Jesus, too. And just not going to happen. But uh, that's one of the things that uh, churches lie about more than anything. So... The purpose of the flood was to wipe out these satanic fallen angel hybrids. But it also happened after the flood. And guess what? When Israel came out of Egypt and was taken to the promised land, who was there? These same de demonic beings opposing God's will. You know, Satan fought the Lord in heaven lost, was cast to the earth, and he tried to corrupt the bloodline of the Messiah and Adam and succeeded to a large part, and uh, they were in the promised land. I mean, obviously Satan knew where the promised land was and had his children, so to speak, um there to oppose Israel. And of course, what did Israel do? Um, they, the men and the women, both intermarried with these satanic monsters. And I will guarantee you that virtually, probably every major politician is of that seed line. I don't care what country you're in. The giants had six fingers and six toes, and guess what? There's all kinds of celebrities with six fingers and six toes. Marilyn Monroe, Oprah Winfrey, um, I heard Halle Berry. Uh, a lot of them had them surgically removed, especially when they were little as children. I knew a girl personally. I worked with her. She's told me she had six toes. 
Um, of course, I hadn't seen her since early 80s. We were not really friends. We just kind of worked together. I don't know how it came up in conversation because I didn't sure as I sure as didn't believe in the Bible back then. So, what was the purpose of the flood? Well, the what do you take a bath with? You know, water and soap. It cleansed the earth. That's what the purpose of the flood of Noah was. It was to cleanse the earth of these satanic beings. I guess we may as well take a look at chapter 6 of Genesis. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they choose. Well, take a look at Job 38. The sons of God shouted for joy at the creation of the earth. Adam was not formed until six days after the earth was created. So the sons of God cannot be the children of Adam. It is impossible. Unless, of course, he was shouting for joy without a body. Uh, that's the kind of garbage that they teach in demon nominational churches today. So, um, verse 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they choose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be an hundred and twenty years. So, prior to the flood, people lived a long, long time after the flood. 120 years, buddy. That's it. Verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. Yeah, there were giants in the earth prior to the flood, and also after that. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, they... The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Hercules, anybody? Uh, even the Greeks. You know, oh, yeah, well, Hercules, yeah, he was the, the son of a human woman with um, a godfather. A father uh, who was one of the gods. I forget, what was his name? Was it Zeus? I think it was Zeus. I, I don't I don't I don't remember. Man, you're talking a long time ago. But uh, every every culture in the world has legends of the gods coming down from the sky and uh, you know taking wives and giants being born. I mean, Japan, the emperor of Japan, is supposed to be a, a direct descendant of the. Uh, one of the gods that came down and got married to one of the human women. He's a god on earth. Every culture has a legend of a flood. Every, every culture that has written, probably not Africa, but they don't even have a written language uh, that's ancient. I'm talking sub-Sahara Africa. But uh, I'm sure they have oral legends. I mean, look at Jack and the Beanstalk. Uh, Paul Bunyan and Babe. You know, he was a giant. Uh, you know, fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of an Englishman. I mean, come on, people. You know, the Cyclops, the Titans. You know, the modern-day churches have turned the Bible into a fairy tale. Well, I don't do that. Verse 4, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Believers and unbelievers do not have giants for children. I'm sorry. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 
And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Now there's a big difference between man repenting and the Lord repenting. Man has to repent of the wickedness in his ha life. God does not. God might repent. He repented of uh, destroying Nineveh when they, re when they turned away from their sin, repented. But anybody that takes, compares sinful man repenting with the Lord repenting and tries to make you think it means the same thing are deceivers, liars, satanic idiots. There's a very famous internet preacher that does that in Tempe, Arizona. No, thank you. Verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 8. But, but Chaplain Bob, there, we didn't have grace until the New Testament. Really? I found grace here in Genesis, Old Testament. People say there was no grace in the Old Testament, just law? And wrath and judgment? Well, what can I tell you? These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. What's a generation? His children, his bloodline. Matter of fact, look at the first four words, uh, first four letters of that word, G-E-N-E. -E. That's where you get the word Genesis which means to generate. Generations, gene, DNA. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. Why would the Lord say that? Because everybody else was not perfect in their genes or generations. They were corrupted. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And I wonder if they had all the same mother or different mothers. I don't know. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So... Just remember, all does not always mean all. I mean, you know, let's face it. Paul wrote that, uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Does that mean that Jesus had sin? For all have sinned? No, because in the book of Hebrews, it says that uh, Jesus was tempted as we are in all points, yet without sin. So all does not mean all. It excludes Christ. Well, it just told you that Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, but then it says, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So, I hope you know the rest of the story. Noah makes an ark. Only the families get on. Boom. But um, Ham and Canaan were... Uh, tied in with the Canaanites and the giants, which were the Philistines. But, you know, this isn't a study about all that. So, people, somebody wrote me, matter of fact, yesterday, and, uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of the Book of Enoch, and I don't get my stuff on the giants from the Book of Enoch. I get it from the Bible, okay? So... Don't accuse me of getting doctrine from the book of Enoch. I kind of look at it as history, not scripture. But that's just my opinion. Uh, according to the book of Enoch, the fallen angels, the watchers as they called them, taught mankind spells and potions and magic. 
And if you want to learn about spells, potion, and magic, you can read the Kabbalah. Yeah. You can read all about it. Came right out of T Babylon. You know? I mean, somebody taught these people magic. You know, it wasn't the Lord. Where'd they learn it? You think they just learned it by themselves? You know, the Bible talks about familiar spirits. You know, uh, and, and they weren't good spirits. They were bad spirits. Necromancy. Necro means dead. I mean, talking to the dead. But you're not really talking to the dead. You're talking to the devils. Uh, I came out of the New Age. I mean, I, I believed when I was a middle school kid, but uh, the TV preachers turned me against the churches and the hypocrisy I saw in the churches. And, uh, of course, getting into high school, you know, I wanted to live a life of sin. So I rejected everything. But uh, years later, started looking into the New Age, which looked really promising. And then one day I wandered into the, um, the back room of the occult bookstore and saw all these books on Satanism and magic. And lo and behold, what was the most highest symbol of, of magic and witchcraft? The six-pointed star. I saw that in all my Bible teachings when I was in middle school kicked in. And I was, you know, then I had some people witness to me the true gospel, not the garbage they teach on TV. And I knew I had to make a choice. So, there you go. So, the Lord has cleansed the earth with water. Now, let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, I guess we'll go to verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that's me, the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. I did a Bible study on that. Um, where was Christ for three days when he was dead? I mean, he he did he had he wasn't resurrected uh, and went to heaven till later. So where was he? He went to Abraham's bosom for three days and preached to all the Old Testament saints. Uh, read the Abraham's bosom. Uh, the rich man and Lazarus. Read it, uh, people. All you got to do is click on my name uh, on YouTube. I'm also on Brighteon. I mean, I'm sorry, BitChute. Brighteon is garbage. Uh, I, I loaded a video and I get about 12 views. It's, it's not even hardly worth. And they hide it. I can't even comment on my own channel. I mean, that's how horrible Brighteon is. Mike Adams is a gatekeeper. But um, BitChute, I'm on there. But the uh, point I'm making is on YouTube, you click on my name, takes you to the home page, and it'll say playlist. Click on it. I've got all kinds of subjects. Then you go to the right hand side on that line, and there's a little like a magnifying glass. Go to there, type in a subject or a name of somebody, you know, King David or, you know, uh, resurrection or repentance or forgiveness. And I'll guarantee you a whole list of Bible studies will come up. I've got over a thousand Bible studies. Over a thousand. Send me a, a USB drive. I'll send you copies of everything I got. I don't care. Post them. Post them anywhere, because one day my channel is going to be gone. And when it when it when YouTube knocks me off, that's probably going to be it. But uh, 
Jesus went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Interesting study. And and I've heard preachers say, Oh, Jesus didn't go to hell. Yes, he did for three days. He went to Abraham's bosom, which was a compartment in hell. He wasn't in the flames, just like Lazarus, just like Abraham. The rich man was in the flames, but not Lazarus, not Abraham, not Christ. It's an interesting study. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, but, but once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Eight souls were saved by water. Do you know that the flood of Noah was the salvation of his family? It was the destruction of the world. The next time, the world's going to be cleansed by fire. And let me tell you something. Fire disinfects. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, when they wanted to do surgery out in the field, like, you know, in the armed military, they would use a flame to disinfect the... Uh, the scalpel, the cutting instruments. So there's not going to be uh, a flood anymore. And isn't it funny how the uh, Sodomite community uses that rainbow flag for their symbol? They're basically, no, they're not basically, they are mocking the Lord. Like, oh, well, you're not going to flood us anymore. Because the rainbow was the sign of the Lord's covenant with Noah that he would no longer destroy the earth in a flood. Next time it's going to be water, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. There was a guy, Werner Heller or Keller. He wrote a book in the 50s called The Bible is History. You can pick it up on Amazon. Uh, I would get the first one or sec, first or second edition. Uh, second edition is probably good uh, for you know three, four, five bucks. They were digging around the Dead Sea and they found a layer of glass, glass, uh, in the sand. Now that's how they make glass. They they take sand, silica sand, and they melt it. And then they pour it, and it turns into glass. But you cannot, you cannot have an open air fire and melt sand. It's, it doesn't get hot enough. You got to have what's called a blast furnace, where you're feeding oxygen into an enclosed area where you're concentrating the heat. That's how they melt steel. Well, iron. They melt iron to. Uh, mix it with carbon to make steel. Uh, you just can't do it with an open-air fire. So what made this layer of glass in the sand? Brimstone, I guess, when the Lord rained down brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what? They, did, they didn't even know what it, uh, the sand in the glass, um, the glass in the sand was until they started doing nuclear uh, atomic testing out in the Nevada desert. They found glass. The sand had been melted and turned into glass. They were like, whoa, what's this? Well, you know, they say, well, you know, oh, evolution. You know what? We're still waiting for science to catch up to the Bible. So, all right, uh, which sometimes were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure, whereunto even baptism, did you know the flood of Noah was likened unto baptism? Baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The flood of Noah was likened unto 
baptism. The earth had a baptism of water. And what did John the Baptist do? He baptized people unto repentance for the filthiness of the flesh. But what did Christ do? Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Big difference. All right, let's take a look at Exodus chapter 2. Um, if I read every verse where water or waters is mentioned, uh, this study would be long, 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 long. I could already tell this is going to be a multi-part study. So let's go take a look at Exodus chapter 2. And there went a man of the house of Levi. Levi, he was the... Uh, the uh, father of the Levites. They were to be the tribe of the priests. They were to be the ones that would serve the Lord in the tabernacle, as opposed to Judah, which was the king tribe. Uh, so, and there went a man of the house of Levi and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. They were both pure-blooded. And the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Now remember, Pharaoh, this is in the days of Egypt, Pharaoh had commanded that all the male children be cast into the Nile. You ever heard of a Nile crocodile? That'd be a, you know, baby would be a little tidbit for a ton, one ton crocodile, you know, or half ton, whatever they weigh. I don't know. They're huge. You know, they get to be... Uh, about six meters, 18 foot long. They weigh, I don't know, a thousand pounds. They could take down a full grown wildebeest. They can, you know, be a nice little tidbit, little six, seven pound child, right? Uh, that's why I don't feel sorry for the, uh, you know, when the Lord destroyed Egypt with the, fl uh, the plagues of Egypt and he killed all the firstborn. Yeah. Well, you killed all the Hebrew boys called payback some people would call it karma i don't but uh yeah so uh all right so and she hid him three months and when she could no longer hide him she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink and his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. So I guess this is Miriam. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walked along by the riverside. When she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child. Behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child, child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. Nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and she became, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. So Pharaoh's daughter named Moses. And she called his name Moses and said, and she said, because I drew him out of the water. Did you know the word Moses means drawn out of the water? That's what Moses means. I drew him out of the water. So, all right, let's go to Exodus chapter 14. Uh, the first Passover has happened, all the plagues of Egypt. Uh, Pharaoh tells Moses, get the heck out of here. I'm tired of looking at you. Uh, well, that's the Bob translation. So Moses gets, tells everybody, get, gather yourselves together. Let's get out of here. And um, 
they're uh, hightailing it out of Dodge, so to speak. And then Pharaoh uh, decides, wait a minute, what, what did I do here? All our slaves are gone. What in the, we're going to have to do our own work? No, 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 no. Let's go get them and bring them back. I'm, you know, I guess he forgot the, uh, the seven plagues, you know. Well, let's, uh, let's read about this. Exodus 14, verse 10. So here it is. Uh, Pharaoh gathered his army and he's going after Israel. I remember Egypt was a major world power back in these days. Major world power. I mean, they were like one of the, they might have been the major world power back in this day. I'm not sure exactly, but they were very powerful. And when, uh, verse 10, Exodus 14, 10, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us, to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, leave us alone, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we would uh, we should die in the wilderness. Boy, I tell you what, what a bunch of crybabies. They cry to the Lord because uh, their burdens and afflictions. And then when the Lord tries to deliver them, they cry, you know, they're just, they're just never happy, you know. I've known people that if you were shoveling money into their house, uh, they'd be unhappy because you put it in the wrong corner or, oh, I didn't want it in this room. I want it in that room. I mean, really, there's just some people that are just miserable. Could never be happy. Verse 13, and Moses said unto the people, fear not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Boy, that would be a good thing to hear, huh? Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you, show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord spake, said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. Uh, there's people that are going to tell you that uh, this is not the Red Sea, but this is the Sea of Reeds, which is like ankle deep water. And that was the miracle of, you know, Israel crossing the Sea of Reeds, you know, shallow. But the real miracle is how did Moses, uh, you know, cause the, uh, well, the Lord, with by the hand of Moses, how did he cause the Egyptian army to, to drown in ankle-deep water? That's the real miracle here. So... This is the kind of garbage that they teach in churches nowadays. So, but lift up, uh, but lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one 
came not near the other all the night. Uh, there, when you got the Lord's cloud there, I think the Egyptians had enough sense to stay the heck away. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry land, and the waters were a wall, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them, to the midst of the sea, even all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked upon the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels. So here it is, you're trying to chase after Israel and your chariots are, uh, I guess that's like your car getting four flat tires, right? Chariot wheels fall, fell off. Can you imagine that with 600 chariots? Uh, that would block the way, wouldn't it? And took off their chariot wheels that they drive them heavily so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, there remained not so much as one of them. Uh, you know what? When you're wearing... Uh, battle armor you know they were wearing metal armor it's pretty hard to swim when you got uh, pounds of armor on your body you know you drown I mean, that's just you know that's how it works but the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea and the waters were a wall uh, unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Uh, one thing we should uh, mention too is uh, when Moses was leading the congregation for the Lord in uh, the desert. Uh, they were, you know, you're not going to find water in the desert. So everybody's crying, well, where's our water? So what did the Lord said? Verse 17 and verse 6 of the book of Exodus. Exodus 17, 6. It says, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall water, and there shall water come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Numbers 20 and verse 8. Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. Uh, so, in Deuteronomy 8.15, Who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint? Psalms 114, verse 8. Who turned the rock into a standing water, the flint into a fountain of waters? So, now in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now remember, Corinthians were the people that lived in the Greek city-state of Corinth, it was a major province. 
Uh, they were Greeks. Of course, they had been conquered by the Romans. Uh, but uh, Paul speaking to them. Now remember, the New Testament was written in Greek, not Hebrew. Remember that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Remember, we just read in Exodus that there was a cloud of the Lord that separated Israel from Egypt, the Egyptians, and they all passed through the sea. What sea? The Red Sea. Remember, Israel was on dry ground and the Egyptians got, uh, well, they got the wall of water that uh, drowned them. Verse 2, very, very important. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Did you know that Israel crossing the Red Sea under Moses was likened here being baptized? And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. What did God feed them with? Manna. Verse 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. Remember the rock brought forth water? Oh yeah. Moses spoke to the rock, struck the rock, it brought forth water. Fountains of water. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Remember, Christ is considered the rock. Remember the cornerstone? Christ is called the cornerstone. I guess we could take a look at that real quick. How about Isaiah 28, 16? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious corner stone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Jeremiah I'm sorry, Psalms 118, 118, verse 22. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. Acts 4.11. This is a stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Luke 20.17. And he, he beheld them and said... What is this then that is written, the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. Ephesians 2.20 And are built upon the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner stone. And that rock was Christ. All right, let's take a look at Daniel chapter 2. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had his dream, and he, nobody could figure it out. But uh, the Lord was gracious to Daniel and gave him the interpretation. Verse 30, Daniel 2, verse 30. Excuse me. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. But for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation of the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold. Um, there's a verse in the Bible that says that Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand. Uh, gold is representative of the Lord. I mean, how do you spell God? G-O-D. How do you spell gold? G-O-L-D. You know, uh, metals, colors, 
and numbers all have meanings in the Bible. Uh, they're in worthy studies in and of themselves. So, uh, all right. So, the image's head was of fine gold. His breast and his arms of silver. Um, silver is I my I believe is what believers are likened to that make it into the kingdom. Uh, the Bible talks about where the Lord says He uh, wants to refine us as fine silver. There's an interesting story I heard. Um, somebody said, "Well, you know, a refiner. Well, you've heard of refinery. Well, it's purification. Uh, there's when you mine metals out of the ground. I mean, it's you've got other impurities in it. You know, you might have iron, silver, bronze, co well, copper. You know, and you got to separate them. You know, if you want to separate the silver from all the other stuff." So you got to melt it down and then scrape off all the other stuff. So, to purify it. Well, somebody once asked and says, well, to a silver, a guy that would purify silver. And he says, how do you know when the silver is purified and ready to, you know, to be uh, poured into the mold? And he says, well, you know, when you melt it down and you're looking into the bowl, when you can see your reflection like a mirror, you know the silver is ready. And maybe that's kind of a symbol of what the Lord, you know, when the Lord looks at us and sees the reflection of his son, we're ready. I don't know. His breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass. Uh, brass is kind of like the natural man without the spirit. Verse 33. His legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. When you look at iron the first time in the Bible, it's tied into Tubal Cain, the child of Cain, one of the ch Cain's children, who... Uh, they love to call the Kenites, the Kenites. Uh, and then, so the, the legs were of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Well, what did the Lord make Adam from? Clay. So is this a mixing of the Kenites, the Kenanites, with Adam kind? You know, they don't mix. They can't mix. Verse 34. Thou sawest till that a stone, the stone was Christ, right? Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Well, that's going to happen when Christ returns, right? Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, o king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. Moreover, the children of men dwelt, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given unto thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom, now this is the 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 end time kingdom people the fourth kingdom and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdue all things and as iron that breaketh all these things shall it break in pieces and bruise and whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron the kingdom shall be divided but there shall be in it of the strength of iron in as much i'm sorry for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay
And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Does that make sense? Genesis 6, sons of God, daughters of men. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Do you know that word men has reference to Adam? Did you know that Adam is a, ref, uh, a racial description? It means ruddy, to be able to show blood in the face. Don't look in the modern Strong's uh, Hebrew concordance for that. You won't find it, but the old one you will. They changed the meaning of the words. Adam means man. It has a racial connotation. I guess that makes me a racist, right? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as Thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. According to legends of Japan, the uh, gods came down from the sky and taught them how to make those Japanese samurai swords. Because, you know, steel is basically iron mixed with carbon. So they would take, um, and, and steel is ten times stronger than iron because of the carbon bond. So they would take uh, wood chips, I guess, burnt you know, like charcoal or whatever, mix it with the uh, iron and um, make steel. And Japanese know a thing or two about steel. Let me tell you something. They they know a few couple things. Uh, matter of fact, according to some sources, the Japanese were making steel swords back when we were in the Bronze Age. So, uh, all right, in Genesis 4, starting in verse 20, we're talking about Cain's lineage. And Adah bare Jabal, he was the father of such as dwell in tents, and of such as have cattle. And his brother's name was Jubal, he was the father of such as handled the harp and the organ. Music, right? And Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. Do you know what a, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron? The word art is in artificer. This is not just somebody that's a blacksmith. This is somebody that's, you know, if you're an artificer, you're skilled. You're not just making horseshoes. I mean, you're making... Uh, intricate items. An instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. So the first time iron is mentioned in the Bible, it's talking about Cain's children. Tubal Cain. You uh, do a little studying in the Masonic Lodge, you will mention, you will find mention of Tubal Cain. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nema. And, uh, well, I, yeah. Cain uh, was not a very good character, right? So, all right, well, I guess this is going to be part one of water. Uh, I don't know how many parts this is going to be, but, you know, what can I tell you? I'll try to make it at least two parts 
All right, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, by the way, people, uh, I got a lot of Bible studies. You know, I don't have to be doing new ones. I got a lot of old ones, and a lot of them are, you know, they're informative. Uh, personally, I like the uh, Joseph series I did, Study and Forgiveness. I thought that was a really good one. I thought Isaiah was good. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, Elijah. So, and like I say, send me a uh, USB drive, send me an email, palm, like a tree, Palm Beach Weddings at weddings with an S at gmail.com and give you an address or, you know, send me a USB drive, 64 gig, and I'll send you everything I got. And do with it whatever you want to do. You can print it up and throw darts at it as far as I care. But, uh, yeah. All right. All glory to Jesus. Amen.